So Abhijit has joined. Hi Abhijit. Good morning, sir. It's like an old friend uh, meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, great. So, uh, let's start. I think uh, good evening and good morning to uh, Mr. Carter. Good evening, sir. Uh, as a part of birth centenary celebrations of Dr. Kurian, today we are happy to have with us Mr. Thomas Carter, former senior advisor NDDB, uh, to deliver a talk on the theme Dr. Kurian, uh, leader and institutional builder. I think every app topic uh, which uh, we suggested and he has agreed to deliver the talk. Uh, Mr. Carter has joined us from Los Angeles, United States. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and to all those who have joined and will be joining us for today's talk. Uh, before I request Mr. Carter to deliver his talk, uh, may I take this opportunity to speak a few words uh, in his introduction? Uh, Mr. Tom Carter, as he is known in NDTV, uh, was associated with NDTV from 1989 uh, to uh, 2000, if I remember correctly, and in his capacity as senior advisor. During his association with NDTV, he was involved in, in uh, designing mass education programs for dairy farmers, institutional development programs providing support in development of policies and programs for Indian cooperative dairy and also the oilseed industries and design development support to the training uh, of trainers program. He was closely associated with uh, the cooperative uh, initiative panel uh, at Irma. Mr. Carter has uh, dedicated over half of his professional career uh, to working in various parts of India between 1960s and 2000. In his career spanning more than 50 years, in addition to his association with NDDB, he worked with various international organizations and programs such as uh, Peace Corps, World Council of Credit Unions, Cooperative League of USA, and Food and uh, Agriculture Organization, FAO of the United Nations and also the U.S. Agency for International uh, Development. Mr. Carter did his post-graduation in philosophy from Nagpur University and PhD from University of California. So we are privileged, really privileged to have you with us for delivering this talk on Dr. Kurian, leader and institutional builder as a part of our Dr. B. Kurian leadership lecture series. And we look forward to an engaging session today there will be some question and answer session after the talk. And may I now invite you uh, to deliver this session. Welcome again, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone who is present. Nice to see some old friends. Uh, I'd like to thank NDDP for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, about some of my experiences with Dr. Kudu. He was someone who taught me a, a great deal. He inspired me, helped me to define my life's work. He was a great man, but he was also a funny man, a kind and thoughtful man. When it came to speeches, Dr. Kudian had a absolute rule. 15 minutes was the limit. No one, he said, would pay attention after that. Uh, if you read the uh, speeches that uh, are in his book, An Unfinished Dream, you'll see that he pretty much adhered to that rule. But it's virtually impossible to speak about Dr. Kurian in 15 minutes. It would probably take that long to read out all his positions uh, and the awards he received. Dr. Kurian was a legend in his own lifetime, and perhaps since his passing, his legend has grown. But legends tend to blur uh, the existence of someone who that person really was and the reasons why they became a legend. 
I had the extraordinary privilege of uh, knowing and working for Dr. Korean for more than 20 years. Uh, I wouldn't presume to say that I really knew him, but I did have the opportunity to see him head a truly wonderful organization, to face challenges, to seize opportunities, and more importantly, to transform challenges into opportunities, opportunities that always were designed to serve India and its rural people. Recently, I had a, a chat with Dr. R.P. Aneja, who served NDDB as secretary and managing director. And at one point, Dr. Aneja mentioned that Dr. Kurian's role was very similar to that of an Operation Flood spearhead team leader. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Mantham. If you haven't, make it a point to do so. The film tells the story of a spearhead team it tries to form a dairy cooperative in a village where a milk contractor has exploited farmers and fights to retain control. In many ways, Dr. Kurian, on a far broader and larger scale, was like the team leader, Dr. Rao. Today, in virtually every part of India, milk is readily available, so much so that most people take the availability of milk, ghee, butter, cheese, and sweets for granted. I can testify to the fact that in the 1960s, that was far from the case. As a student at Nagpur University's postgraduate teaching department in 1963-64, I longed for a glass of milk, for a glass of any milk. Only after I'd been in India for several months did I find a milk stand in Punjab where I could briefly satisfy that craving. As I mentioned, today many younger people simply take the availability of milk for granted. They've forgotten or perhaps don't even know that today's plenty arose from what could be described as the ashes of India's dairy industry. It was a long and difficult battle to get the central and state government to approve Operation Flood and an ongoing struggle to implement that project in the face of what was sometimes fierce opposition. Looking back, I'm sure by now you've heard the story of how Dr. Korean was assigned to a government creamery in Anand, met and helped Sri Turbhavan Das Patel with the fledgling Khara District uh, Union, and was about to leave for a job in Bombay, but agreed to stay and help set up the new dairy equipment he had urged be purchased. And as he often said, he never left. But it's worth reflecting for a moment on why he stayed and why he never left. We all know that Dr. Kurian was a brilliant, exceptionally skilled and talented individual. In addition to that initial job offer from a multinational in Bombay, over the years, he was offered many other opportunities to leave on him, whether for international organizations, the political establishment, senior bu bureaucratic positions. But he never left. I personally believe that uh, Trivalan uh, Das Patel was one reason, perhaps the major reason Dr. Kurian stayed. Dr. Kurian's mentor was a man of great integrity and principle, someone who believed in the noble cause of India's independence and who recognized that true independence could only be achieved when every Indian, especially those who lived in rural India, had an equal place under the Indian sun. Trivalan Das Patel was a powerful man, a political kingmaker, yet he lived and died in a one-room home. His commitment was to India and to the country's rural people. Dr. Kurian was someone who I believe was looking for a purpose in life, a purpose that went well beyond personal wealth and status. He saw in Trubhavandas Patel a man who lived his beliefs, and I believe that Dr. Kurian absorbed those beliefs and those values made them his own, and devoted his life to their pursuit. When, once those values became central to his life, Dr. Kurian developed a vision that would allow him to pursue and realize the dream of the rural Indians becoming equal partners in the national project. In the first chapter of An Unfinished Dream, written in 1957, 
Dr. Kurian outlined a vision for daring in India, a vision that the reader will easily recognize as the blueprint for his life's work. He once quoted Jean Monnet, the architect of European. Some problem with Carter Saab's bandwidth looks like. Hello? Yes, sir. You are, yeah, yeah. We are, you are now uh, yes. audible. Yeah. We lost you for yeah, some time. I'm, I'm on my phone now because my internet connection uh, crashed. So please uh, continue, sir. Please continue. Yes. Uh, I was talking about the, the ideas of Operation Flood that were basically outlined in the, in the paper that Dr. Kurian wrote in 1957. Uh, it's important to emphasize that the core of that idea was that daring was a path to a decent life uh, for tens of millions of rural Indians. It could become the means to education of children, to adequate housing, medical care, and participation in the democratic process. Central to achieving that better life was membership in a cooperative structure one that would return the maximum amount of the consumer's rupee to the producer. But more importantly, it would empower members with the belief that working together, they could achieve far more than any single individual could accomplish in, by themselves. Realizing this vision required more than Tribhuvandas Patel and Dr. Kuryu. It required a team of talented, energetic, and committed people. In the relatively early days of Anand, Dr. Kurian seduced his Michigan State classmate, H.M. Dalaya, asking him to solve the many technical problems that would have to be overcome to produce quality milk and milk products. He brought in V.H. Shah to find ways to build dairies and equipment that would produce quality and an afford at an affordable cost. At one point, as Dr. Kurian bragged, he had more PhDs working for Amul and worked for anyone else in India. He also attracted Michael Hulse, a Harvard scholar who had worked at IIM Ahmedabad and who formed a partnership with Dr. Kurian to help develop the plans that led to Operation Flood. With the formation of NDDB, the need for committed young people increased. In recruiting, Dr. Kurian looked for young people with a capacity for commitment. As he would tell potential officers, if you have the commitment, we can, we can help you learn the skills. Some officers came to NDDB from Amal. Others were recruited from veterinary schools and departments, from engineering graduates. 
from the dairy science field from IIM and the bun. You would probably know some of the names, Dr. R.P. Aneja, Dr. Amrita Patel, uh, Dr. A. A. Chotani, V.S. Bella, Tushar Shah, P.K. Nagar, Shalendra Kumar, P.G. Karup, Madhavan, S.C. Malhotra, N.V. Bellawadi, P.G. Gore, and others. With Dr. Kurian as their team leader, these were the people who devoted their lives to transforming a dream into reality. I had the privilege of working with many of them, people with, for whom an eight-hour day was just the start. We spent seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, eating, breathing, thinking, and most of all, working to transform the lives of India's rural producers. Looking back, I believe that Tribhuvan Das Patel inspired Dr. Kurian, Dr. Kurian inspired his team, and that team performed miracles. Please remember, that in those early days, India's milk production was in decline. Urban milk schemes depended on imports of milk powder and butter. State veterinary departments, milk commissioners, dairy development departments, and the like were dominating the often stop-and-go efforts to develop dairy. Firms like Larson & Tupro, Alpha Laval, were the manufacturers and importers of dairy equipment. Milk was rationed. Cheese and butter came in cans, and those when you open them, they smelled pretty bad. Foreign experts claimed that it was not possible to make milk powder from buffalo milk. There was no national milk grid, no cold chain from dairy to urban consumer, much less one within rural India. Put yourselves in the shoes of Amal and NDB in the 1960s. Think of the range of technical and logistical challenges they faced. Think, too, of promoting cooperatives. Educating potential members, training managing committees and staff, all from scratch. Thinking through all of that had to be done, developing and testing methods and approaches, they then working tirelessly to create a cooperative structure. These were people who spent months in every year in rural areas working to uh, develop co-ops and their membership. The very origin of Operation Flood was the threat of a growing European dairy commodity surplus being donated to India by, as Dr. Kurian used to say, some kind, kindly European gentleman. Had that happened, the Qatar Cooperative would have been washed away by a different kind of flood, a flood of cheap donated commodities. Dr. Kurian, recognizing the threat, built an alliance within the central government, and with knowledgeable and sympathetic international dairymen like Sir Richard Trahane, chairman of Britain's Milk Marketing Board. Well, Operation Flood has been foreshadowed by Dr. Kurian's 1957 paper, developing a design for the project required an extraordinary effort uh, that involved young uh, NDDB officers, Michael Hulse, and Dr. Kurian. They completed this uh, effort to the satisfaction of the government of India and the World Food Program, the first step in India's dairy revolution. While much is made of Dr. Kurian's uh, tussles with the bureaucracy and politicians, it's also important to recognize that there were politicians and bureaucrats who were incredibly helpful, who respected uh, Dr. Kurian and who supported what he tried to do. Many of those within and without India who went along with Operation Flood did so with the assumption that nothing so ambitious could succeed. Keep in mind, there was a dairy establishment within India, and it had an implicit alliance with European and Oceanic, uh, Oceania su suppliers of dairy commodities. But by the early 1980s, Operation Flood was proving successful. Dairies had been built and were in operation. Large numbers of co-ops and millions of members were collecting increasing amounts of milk. National milk production had increased over the decade from 22 to 33 million tons. All commodity donations were canalized through the Indian Dairy Corporation. The assumption that all would return to the status quo ante before Operation Flood was beginning to look pretty shaky to the Europeans uh, who thought it would simply open the door for more exports of milk. About that time, uh, there was an onslaught of attacks 
by journalists and academicians within India and abroad. The Illustrated Weekly of India, then the leading uh, periodical in the country, uh, published articles by Claude Alvarez, Bharat Dokra, British Nandi, claiming, ironically, that Operation Flood was a plot to open the door for large-scale imports of dairy commodities from, from Europe. European academicians, most notice, noticeably those at the uh, Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, wrote papers and books attacking Operation Flood. The Indian dairy establishment went for the jugular, raising starred questions in Parliament, assailing Operation Flood. The agriculture minister responded by saying that an investigation would be carried out. The news of the minister's response hit NDB like a thunderbolt. India's highest agricultural authority, the minister, had given credence to fictitious claims about Operation Flood. To the very last officer, over 900 officers resigned. When the news of that resignation hit the newspapers, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi took action. She ensured that a truly independent and objective committee chaired by L.K. Jha, a seasoned and highly respected ICS officer who had served as governor of the Reserve Bank, would lead that committee. The committee looked in depth at the working of Operation Flood and concluded that it had achieved much and was poised to achieve far more. The committee made a number of recommendations that would ease the challenges faced in implementing the project. Perhaps the most important of these was that NDB and the Indian Dairy Corporation, until then a, a government corporation, be merged into a new autonomous statutory body. This was formalized in the National Dairy Development Board Act of 1987. Let me also briefly mention the project to restructure oilseed and edible oil production and marketing. In the late 1970s, the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, also the chairman of uh, Kedah District, <coughs> Uh, noted that the price of edible oil was nearly on a par with milk. Oilseed, was which was grown on rain-fed land, often in relatively poor soil, and that farmers who grew oilseeds were probably the poorest and most exploited in the country. The Goyla throne, NDDB picked up the challenge, and NDDB team, the oilseed and vegetable oil wing, was formed and edible oil donations were negotiated with Canada and the United States. As with Operation Flood, a team of young officers burned the midnight oil to plan and then implement the project. Over a decade, India's oil imports dropped from over 2 million tons to fewer than 200,000 tons, with oilseed meal exports more than paying for the cost of the imports. Tragically, the government of India bowed to international pressure and opened the floodgate to donor-subsidized oil imports, which pretty much ru ruined all those efforts. Let me mention an obstacle to the program that Dr. Kudian faced, the oilseed program that Dr. Kudian faced with great courage. For reasons that had their focus on a corrupt U.S. aid official and nothing to do with NDDB, the U.S. aid inspector general took a stand that the oilseed project should be subjected to a full audit. Dr. Kurian refused, citing the project agreement that assigned audit responsibility to the NDDB statutory auditor and indirectly to the auditor and controller general of India. Dr. Kurian was prepared to forego tens of thousands of tons of donated oil, millions of dollars worth of oil, <coughs> before he would violate the principles involved. Fortunately, a senior official of AID pointed out to the agency's administrator that Dr. Kurian had many enemies within India who would pounce on any misuse of funds. That they had never done so was a cert certificate of integrity that allowed the dispute to be resolved. In the end, uh, a 100% audit of all the transactions that had been done by the OLT project only a tiny percentage of project funds were disallowed because they had been used for advertising, which was forbidden by the contract. Dr. Kurian's integrity then and so often provided him with a shield that allowed him to fight with courage for India's rural poor. 
all of NDDB's projects involve detail planning. Within a broad vision, the nuts and bolts were thought through with great care. That said, in the early 1980s, an American academician, David Gordon, included NDB as one of four examples of learning organizations. As thorough as NDB, uh, and he contrasted these with donor organizations, which, which he described as blueprint organizations, who would make a plan and never leave it. As thorough as NDDB's planning was, Dr. Kurian encouraged NDB's officers to recognize, learn from, and make changes when mistakes were discovered. In, 1980, in a 1983 uh, address at Siddhar Patel University, Dr. Kurian said, when Operation Flood was being drafted, the question was faced, what is true development? What we wanted was development of man, and that too, development of the most neglected of our men and women in India, that is, our farmers. This could only be achieved if we dragged them into the process of development and gave them responsibility. As I said, I believe Dr. Kurian was inspired by Tribhuvandas Patel, and his focus was always on India's rural people. He believed that India would become and remain a just and equitable nation only when its rural people found their full place under the Indian sun. All that he said and did in his life was to that end. Thinking of Dr. Kurian as an institution builder. Institutions, contrary to what uh, MBA programs teach, are not organizational charts, they're not horizontal, vertical, or flat chains of command. They're not self-sufficiency or public applause. They're not brick and mortar or mission slogans. Institutions are values and a shared commitment to those values, a commitment grounded in integrity and defended with courage. Those were the institutions that Dr. Kurian built. He lived his vision and values and that inspired those who worked with him. I had the privilege of working with NDB. I saw Dr. Kurian's vision and values embedded in the minds and hearts of all those who worked with the organization. It was an extraordinary experience. It's now a quarter of a century since Dr. Kurian handed over the reins of the Dairy Board. In an early paper on the formation of NDDB and the start of Operation Flood, the following is written. Quote, old dairy hands in India foresaw the, foresaw the day when NDDB would lose its youthful initiative and slide into the morass of bureaucratic inertia. Poor standards of performance and indifference to the interests of producers and consumers alike which characterized many dairy organizations at that time. In the years after those words were penned, Dr. Kurian found new challenges to keep NDDB from losing its useful initiative. Oil seeds, fruits and vegetables, salt, veterinary pharmaceuticals. There are challenges today. Meeting them requires a renewed commitment to the vision and values that Dr. Kurian lived. It means placing the people of rural India first. It means unyielding professional and personal integrity. It means courage, the courage to put yourselves on the line for what you believe is just and right. For yours is and always will be a noble cause. Thank you and happy Diwali. Thank you, sir. Happy Diwali to you also. Thank you. Anyone having any questions? Any query? Any anything who wants to know? Well, I'm, I must be a total failure if there are no questions. No, no. <laughs> you have more. Yes. Uh, sir, one question which is generally asked to us is, when there was 
the successful model of Amul taking up, why Mother Dairy was established? <laughs> Well, Mother Dairy was established, if you if, if you go back, Mother Dairy was established, the Mother Dairy in Delhi, <coughs> uh, and, and in uh, Chennai and Calcutta, they were established in order to provide a market for, for milk. The question is not why, why it was established, but perhaps why it has remained uh, a... An NDDB rather than a producer-owned uh, organization, and I, I think I think that uh, probably uh, the time has passed when that could happen. I fear that if today there were an attempt made to uh, basically sell the mother dairies to uh, the, the co-ops, that. Uh, Vested interest in the in the in in the country would basically seize that opportunity to control it themselves rather than allow it to go to the producers. But I would agree that ideally, a mother mother dairies owned and operated, controlled by the producers who supply them, would be ideal. So. Um, yeah, I'm Rajesh Gupta, calling from... Yes, Indonesia. Rajesh. Yeah, yeah. How are you? Fine, sir, fine. It is nice to hear you again. I was just wondering, today's bird, when the individualistic thinking is gaining ground, we are more worried, even in rural areas, everyone think about themselves. And privatization in India is increasing. How do you see the future of cooperative and collective actions? Because sometimes it is really difficult to gather a handful of people who can think, who can really uh, talk about cooperative and collective action. Yes. That's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, I think, I think, uh, the, to some extent, the the experience of the dairy services organizing milk producer companies uh, is encouraging because I think there are over six hundred thousand members now, and they they seem to be performing reasonably well. Uh, I have to, I, 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 the individualism that you speak of is is so dominant in this country. That it's in the United States that it's frightening. Uh, the the sense of a of the social contract, building social capital, is uh, is fading rapidly. But I think in India there's still, I think there still is, there still are people, and I think some some of them I'm talking to right now, who believe that uh, a community is better than an individual, that working together is better than self-aggrandizement, that a, there is a greater good that we can pursue and should pursue. And I think it's a matter of trying to find the message that attracts those people to work in the field, who people who believe genuinely that uh, it's a lot better to work for people than to work for Reliance or whoever. Uh, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to see Anil, Abhijit, and you, uh, who I had the privilege of working with many years ago, still committed to the cause, still working. Uh, and, and I can only believe that your example will and does uh, inspire others. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Mr. Carter. Oh, hello. hello. Um, how do you the, the new Ministry of Cooperation at the center? <laughs> you know the answer. <laughs> I, 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 I think that 
it's a horrible step backwards. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the bane of cooperation began with the British, who uh, did not believe that uh, Indian cooperators could control their own resources. And unfortunately, as Dr. Kurian used to say, uh, the registrars of cooperatives over the years have learned that being God is a good thing and ministers have learned that being the boss of God is even better. Uh, I, I, it's, just, it's just an opportunity to control, not to facilitate. And, I, and I, when, I, when I learned of that, I felt very sad. Well, I hope that the NDDB can um, work out a working relationship with the ministry to ensure its autonomy and uh, the autonomy of cooperatives. One, one hopes that it will be possible. To uh, ma Madam, may I, Madam, may I interrupt? Uh, Madam, we have already done that actually. And... Uh, our officer is involved in uh, forming the charter of the ministry, actually. I know, but you see, a piece of paper is one thing. But yeah, those who are sitting in the chair from time to time, they yes, are the ones that are going to call the shots. So, uh, the issue really is, uh, if you can continue to establish and hold on to a role for NDD, Yes, ma'am. Continues to support truly owned uh, institutions. In fact, one wonders why there is already, when we were moving in the direction of autonomy for cooperatives through the producer companies, and there are these companies are in place now, why they couldn't have, why the government couldn't have uh, uh, created, I mean, the, we hear of a, a separate act being enacted for the producer company, that would have given more freedom to cooperatives. Rather than, an, are you, have you, are you clear what the role of the Ministry of Cooperation is? Uh, no, ma'am. They are still forming the charter, ma'am. That's what I'm saying. Is it beyond milk or will it also include milk? So, uh, uh, they, it will include actually ultimately dairy cooperatives also, but they are in the process of uh, framing a roadmap for them and developing some type of uh, charter so that they have a facilitating role, as Mr. Carter also told, rather than controlling actually. So, that's what we are also uh, trying to speak to them, uh, both at secretary level and uh, the joint secretary level. Uh, fortunately, ma'am, the joint secretary who is there now, he was involved in the, uh, you know, when we passed the Producer Companies Act and he was closely associated with NDS. So we have been able to, able to tell him that this is how uh, the ministry should look forward uh, for helping the cooperatives. Oh. Good morning. I'm Abhijit, sir. Sir, I have a question. What uh, is... Your... I, I don't think... Have, Dr. Patel, have you finished? Well, Minish has finished. Yeah, I, I just uh, concluded, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Abhijit? Yes, sir. See, sir, nowadays, Amul Dairy, apart from its operations in Gujarat, is also picking milk from across the country. In your opinion, is it the right time for Amul Dairy to become Amul to become uh, a multi-state cooperative rather than being a state cooperative? Because what is happening in India today, Amul is procuring milk from across the country, but the benefits are only passed on to the farmers in Gujarat and not to the farmers across. So <laughs> yeah. are, wherever you interact with whoever at Delhi, you find that they, they generally people are not taking it in a nice way. So, what, in your opinion, should they do? Should they form a multi-state cooperative, or still continue the way they are doing? But I would just add to that, which is legally, what would, what would be the issue? What would be the correct situation? I mean, if you are operating in a number of states, 
then legally can you be anything but a multi-state? Well, I, I don't think their membership extends to the other states. I think they're simply uh, collecting milk. Uh, <clears throat> it's it uh, it's a very very in my view a very sad turn of events that uh, uh, almost the individual uh, unions within GCMMF apparently have staked out claims to to milk in different parts of the country and are, as you suggested, collecting it uh, not for the benefit of the farmers in those areas, but rather for the benefit of, of uh, those unions and their leaders. So I... I but do they call the members? Do they call the suppliers members? No. No. No, it's, it's just... It's, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a form of exploitation, unfortunately. So I conclude that they should become a multi-state cooperative, sir. Uh, no, I, th I, th I think that uh, NDDB should go in and organize the producers that are now supplying Amul uh, either as as milk producer companies or as uh, genuine co-ops, so that the, the, the members benefit from the, the milk they produce. Uh, co-ops can co-ops can be exploiters just like the private trade. And uh, if if I think Dr. Patel and uh, Dr. Kurian and all of those who've been involved with NDDB over the years have fought for one thing, and that is to give the producer the returns on their labor and their their investment of time and money. And whether it's Amul or Reliance or uh, the tobacco, ITC, doesn't matter. You, your job is to support the producers. But you see, Mr. Conrad, the, the argument that Amul will put they are giving, they are buying the producer's milk regularly and giving him an income, which otherwise he would not get. So it's a very, it's a kind of uh, thin line. Yeah. Uh, so they have a regular buyer otherwise. But they're, they're, they're operating, I think, if I recall correctly, in areas where the cooperatives have failed to perform. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. And therefore, the, therefore, the producer is taken care of in a way. I, 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 but I would argue that if there were sound cooperatives or milk producer companies in those areas, that the producers would benefit more. Well, I would support that NDDB should get into those areas with that form producer, producer organization. That is a that is a certainly a, a possibility. Should be looked at. We have started actually, madam. Some places where they are already existing or where they have already gone. Right now, the government has also approached NDDB, so NDDB is also going there and uh, about to organize the cooperatives, especially like places like Varanasi and all. Uh, so that's there. I mean, but then. what state governments can do to co-ops. In fact, in many places where Amul is now working, it's because of the uh, involvement of the state governments that the cooperatives have not performed well. Uh, another point, sir, uh, because Gujarat has been the leading uh, uh, leader of the dairy cooperative movement, and we assume that there are matured leadership available in Gujarat. 
but let, that cooperative leadership is not also not seeing the point that we should involve other farmers also in the management and democratic process of cooperative that is very pathetic they should come forward and offer membership to other state people also either through converting multi state cooperative right? or by any other means so they are also very narrowly thinking yeah i I can't help but think that the time has come for uh, uh, a new set of spearhead teams. True. Sure. A rebirth. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask some questions? No one? Yeah, let, let me then thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you today. It's been a, a privilege for me to, uh, uh, to do so. It's been a pleasure to uh, see some old friends and uh, some new ones. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Happy to be here. Happy Diwali. <laughs> Happy Diwali to you, sir. Thank you. Happy Diwali to you. Bye-bye. Yeah.